Um, I was thinking when you were talking about the difference between the Newtonian and the quantum consciousness, and it made me reflect on prayer and how, you know, when we think about the way that we pray, at least particularly in, in churches and communal prayer, that it seems, you know, we're praying to a God out there, um, definitely Newtonian. Um, so, and maybe you're going to get into this later, but I guess what I'm really interested in is how do we translate this into our own um, spiritual practices and particularly prayer? How, how does the the, the quantum consciousness affect maybe the kind of language we use and or uh, the way that we pray and our views of prayer. Right. You know, what prayer is, a, you know, how is it effective? How does yeah. it work? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, my, my remarks actually do move then into theology, from science into theology. So we're going to talk a little bit about God in an evolutionary world. And this afternoon we are going to talk about the inner universe. So, you know, I think we'll... we'll come back to the question of prayer. But um, you know, just a short just a short answer for the moment. I do think we have uh, our Newtonian kind of concept of God. You know, I pray to God, God hears my prayers, or God does not hear my prayers, God answers and does or God does not answer. That kind of kind of categorical, you know, God is, God does, God does not. Uh, God likes me, God does not like me type idea. That is not what we're saying. In fact, one way to reconceive the whole idea of being created by God is perhaps we're quantumly entangled with God from all eternity. You know, so we have to reconceive the whole relationship from the beginning. You know, now using quantum physics, what we know from quantum physics as um, and relationality is the key, the operative word, both in physics and in theology. You know, and so. Uh, you know, in that relationality, it's not so much an, uh, a question and response, it's a growing in trust, a growing in surrender, a growing in, in uh, mutuality. We have, no, we have no sense, I mean, because we do live, you know, not only are we Newtonians, but we're quasi-Aristotelians too, so we have this idea that, you know, our lives don't make really a big difference to God. God is God without, you know, without us. God is willing. And so I think we even need to rethink that notion. You know, if we hold to an, a true interrelatedness, do our lives make a difference to God? Do our actions make a difference to God, you know, to God's godness? Um, so prayer, I think, will play, plays significantly in that. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> So I'm an ancient historian. I was You're ancient, okay. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to ideas of Gnosticism and the yeah. approach to understanding the divine and, sure. and how this may or may not relate to it. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Again, like um, that's where I'm moving towards, actually, incarnation. But I think, you know, Gnosticism, we see a lot of Gnosticism. I, I see a lot of Gnosticism today, especially in sort of the AI technological framework. But basically we're saying, you know, that knowledge is what counts, right? Knowledge saves. That the body is more of a hindrance than anything. And certainly the body is to be transcended. You know, the body is is not a good, in fact, the body for some Gnostics, depending on which flavor you followed, you know, it was um, an evil. Matter, you know, one of the idea of Gnostics, uh, Gnostics is that matter is corruptible, right? Matter decays. And so matter does not matter to matter. The only thing that matters is knowledge, right? This kind of uh, what we know. It's, it's kind of, again, I think it's Cartesian dualism writ large. And I, I see this heresy of dualism. It repeats itself throughout the centuries, and it just comes back in different forms, quite honestly. Good heresies never die out. They just really kind of just get reincarnated. And I think Gnosticism, we see Gnosticism, we're going to talk about AI this afternoon, but you know, AI is a type of Gnosticism, right? The only thing that really matters is the mind. The body, you can replace. It's just, you know, software and hardware. So let's take your your software package out and put it in new hardware, right? That's a type of Gnosticism. It's a type of, of dualism. Uh, but quite honestly, we're, we're buying right into that. You know, we're right there with it. 
So we do, we're, we're not good at incarnational theology. We're going to move in that direction soon. You know, and we're still suspect of nature. I mean, you know, even though we're saying, oh, wow, we emerge from nature. We're deeply entangled with nature. We are part of nature. To use Thomas Berry's notion, you know, the earth is primary, primary, and we're set, you know, we emerge from the earth. It's Mother Earth, right? <clears throat> we're like, oh, yeah, I like that idea. But, you know, when we come to our lived experience, we don't live this way, right? We don't live with the primacy of, of the earth. So, you know, uh, this is, no, I don't want to get too far afield, but you know that religion emerges with consciousness. I mean, I don't, uh, not to kind of go too much in here, but I spell this out in my books, you know, the idea that Native American spiritual, or what we call primal spiritualities, or pre-axial spiritualities, are, are spiritualities that are tribal and mythic and communal and deeply earth-tied. In other words, the spirits that course through the trees and the sun and the sky are the same spirits that course through myself and my neighbors and my community. And that's, that kind of spirituality was was transcended with the rise of axial consciousness, which is where all monotheistic religions and other religions, Jainism and Buddhism, emerged. Axial being this kind of notion of the human person as person, autonomous, free, transcendent. I have a sense of divinity now beyond me, beyond nature. We are in a new axial period called the second axial period or post-axial. So again, it's to say that we're, are, today we're more ecological. We, we have a Younger generations. So here, let me just say this. So we're kind of to kind of address your question as well. We assume that this there's a homogeneity in this Homo sapien species. Absolutely not. Younger generations are born with, on a diff, with a different consciousness. They're wired differently. They look like us, but they are a slightly different species. <laughs> And um, I know it's hard to get our heads around this because we're just acting like we're all, you know, one happy species together. No, we are in evolution and they are the next phase of the evolutionary trend. And, th and it's, a, it's a little bit of the reason why I think younger generations find established religion, um, they, it doesn't compute sometimes. It's not an antipathy to religion. They're, they are religious, you know, they're looking for that connection but it's the, the structures of it. It's axial, and their second axial, that's basically one way, their, their level of consciousness has changed. And, yes? I'm sorry. Where are you? Right here. I'm right sorry. Here. Right here. There you are. Right here. Okay. So that brings me to my question, which is, in the evolutionary process, um, in our consciousness is evolving, I think even as a group, we are beginning to evolve into new thought and new ways of thinking. Um, the churches themselves, I think as we look at them as a body, as a body of people, will that uh, evolution in the church world, you know, I'm, I guess we put I them understand. in two different ways. I mean, there's yeah. the church of the body, the body of the church, and the church world. Yeah. Um, will that, I have hope that that evolution happens. Yeah. Now, they may happen, does evolution happen at various times, in various paces, in, in, of course. in you know, in various right. uh, 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 effects? Yes. Well, you know what I mean? I do. So, <laughs> so what I'm hoping is uh, to get a little bit of insight and hope, as Teilhard gives us, I think. He really yes. does give us hope. Mm -hmm. That, um, that the church itself will evolve and not dissolve. Yeah. Oh, I do. I, I mean, I think, and I see this again, uh, you said it correctly, evolution does not happen consistently across domains, right? It really, it's more local than global. 
And so you'll see even if you look globally, evolution is ha happening at different stages um, around the world. And it really is a confluence of factors. Um, it's both our, uh, what's happening in our environment, our creativity, our imagination, the way we're tool makers, the way we're using tools and creating them, uh, the way those tools are shaping our lives, all that changes, um, it, and it's an interplay, what we call kind of a recursive relationship, right? We create the tools, the tools create us. As we create our environment, the environment changes us. Consciousness, so consciousness, which we're going to talk about soon, this is not something fixed, you know, we don't have like this pineal gland thing going on. <clears throat> uh, we know a little bit more now about consciousness, although, again, quantum physics opens up the realm of consciousness in a whole new way for us. Um, all of this to say is the brain is not a fixed organ. It's not, <clears throat> you know, here's my brain, just put into it what I need to know. This is part of evolution. In fact, a lot of evolution is about brain size, quite honestly. <laughs> you know, it's about a, as the uh, brain capacity, in other words, the folds of the gray matter increase. So we have greater capacity to think. We have a greater capacity for memory. That's also shifting today with technology. You know, so all of this to say is evolution is a function both of brain size, brain capacity, as well as environmental changes. Uh, climate change is a huge factor in evolution. So we cannot talk about evolution as some kind of consistent process that's going on. It is um, a process that uh, involves an interplay of factors, and we're a significant factor in the interplay of evolution. To answer your question about religion, will, you know, will religion evolve? That is a huge question. And here's what I'm, what I'm seeing in my own, as I'm traveling to many different uh, venues, yes and no. It has to evolve, quite honestly. The, and again, you got to stick with my story, you know, because the greatest gap today in our evolutionary movement, in fact, I think the heart of our problems today is religion. It's not economic, it's not historic, it's not social, it's religion. Our religions are deeply institutionally tied to an old cosmology and old philosophies and, you know, basically a lot of dead men, you know, and <clears throat> it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. But we, they're, Newtonian wise, they're comfortable. And here's the other thing. We start, I mean, I'm just going to take the Catholic Church as a case in point. I mean, Catholic Church has done, it, it, it's a patron of the sciences. It has, it actually celebrated the 150th anniversary of Charles Darwin. I mean, we, you know, the Vatican loves modern science. It's produced volumes on chaos and complexity, on evolution. Take a look at it. Does it look like it's evolved? No. So, um, <clears throat> so it's like, yes, this is great. We love to talk about this, but we need more time to really see how we'll work it out. Time's a big factor, right? So the, the world can't wait until the church is kind of have a number of meetings to decide whether or not we should have, you know, this stuff. It's going to happen. New, church, new forms of church will emerge. Religion's going through, I would say, uh, a new developmental period. I foresee something emerging on the horizon that's going to be very new. But not entirely different from the old, because evolution is always the old is subsumed into the new and moves it forward. Yes. I guess to um, follow up with that, um, one of the things that I have been concerned about as we're in, in a sense, transition is the uh, effect of the old on, for example, I'm a, I'm a teacher and, uh, and I've been in a fundamental evangelical church for decades. And so as college-age students are hearing what's being said, they are choosing atheism over faith. And so how do we transition, if you will, for those of us who are locked into the 16th century right. and are trying to break out? Sure. You know, 
Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, I mean, statistically, I, don't, I think atheism is not in the majority. I mean, you know, the nuns are the rising spirituality, the fastest growing spirituality. That's the N-O-N-E-S, right? You know, by the way. So it, it means, like, I don't have any, you know, particular affiliation with any religion. But 96% of them are deeply, right? I'm spiritual but not religious. I'm seeking, I'm looking for... Uh, and by religion, I think, again, they're thinking, I don't want to, they're uh, the kind of postmodern, I don't trust authority, they're, no one's going to tell me what I need to believe. Um, the old guy in the sky thing just doesn't, huh? You're a, yeah, I mean, I'm a nun too. I'm a nun, nun. No, I'm really not a nun, nun. I'm just a nun. So. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, so it's true, and I understand it. But, you know, here's my own experience from teaching undergrads. Um, I do a course on faith, reason, and culture when you can make the connections with them to what the vitality of a religion is about. So religion I take not as the institution, but as the binding force but from the, the ligari, the ligament. What gets you up in the morning, right? What do you live for? You know, what is your life, what, what are you doing, even if your daily job, or why do you go to school at all? Why do you worry about your exams? You know, if there's nothing, if there's no other being, if there's no ground to our lives, then who cares? You know, why don't we just blow ourselves up? Then just you, you know, just have a happy day. Go to Starbucks and indulge yourself on cafe lattes. Um, so there's got to be a sense of meaning and purpose in life, and they know that deep down inside. Young people are they're not that happy with even the nun stuff. Even the spirituality is too little. They want, where do I belong? What's my community? So a, a number of nuns will join intentional forming communities, peace and justice movements, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy the Square Street. You know, they want to make a better world. They know themselves connected. See, this is the slight difference. They are born with little devices almost. You know, their, their minds are oriented towards texting and Snapchatting. You know, so their informational flow is different from older generations. And they're thinking already along those informational lines where older generations are thinking along ontological differences. I'm Protestant, you're Catholic. I'm white, you're black, you know. I'm, I'm Christian, you're Muslim, you know, and we don't have anything in common. Young people are like, huh, you know, who cares? <clears throat> we, we, we have to worry about the poor together. We have to worry about the water together. So that's the thing. We have to help them realize, first of all, history is important. You, you can't know where you're going to unless you know where you're coming from. <clears throat> so history is a great teacher, and there's a lot of wealth in that history, the great insights of many of the great teachers across traditions, of the great you know, spiritual richness. And so when they get a flavor of that, they're like, wow, this is really great. You know, This speaks to them. And then you connect that with the world today, you know, gently, as science is now unfolding that world for us, as we're beginning to live out that world in culture. So I do think that there's ways to make the connection, but it's important that we help them with those connections. When we don't make the connections for them, they will seek a, a place to belong. And it can be a very conservative evangelical environment because it's safe, it's controllable, I, you know, I'm told what I to believe, what to do. This gives me a sense of security. I can go about this very complex world now with a sense of identity and security. It may not be, you know, in a sense, in line with what we now know about the world, but that's the thing. So that's where we begin to make our choices now are out of this rigid, <clears throat> stable mindset, and they're not consonant with nature. They're not consonant. And so we run then into this con conflicting type of existence. So anyway, that's kind of long. Just as a, uh, an aside, you know, we do a survey uh, after each of these lectures, and fully 33% of those who attend the mountaintop lecture experience indicate that they do not attend, attend a church on a regular basis. And I can tell you that most who attend are looking for a sense of community and a curiosity. So it's not just the millennial generation. Wow. OK, that's good to know. So um, are there any other questions? We'll take one more, and then I think we should move on, OK? OK, let's take one here, or here, wherever here is. There you go. Um, 
Several of your slides triggered for me something I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is the whole uh, impact of the patriarchal system in, in our reality, in the past and in the present. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could somehow address the subject of patriarchy in the context of all of this. Right, yes. Well, you know, um, there have been scholars who have really, I'm thinking of the scholar David Noble, a Canadian historian, <clears throat> who basically argued that both science and religion are built on the patriarchal principle of, male, of the male, right, the rule of the male. And, they, and basically he says that's why they both marginalize women, both, both you know, church and, and science. And the whole idea is that, you know, the old tenet of Christianity, poor Adam fell, and we need to restore the, the divine likeness of, of Adam, right? And only males can do that. You know, even the ninth <clears throat> um, century writer, John Arupaseka, said, you know, in the eschaton, I mean, in, eschatologically in heaven, there will be only one sex, and that will be male. <clears throat> Well, guess what? <laughs> uh, Teilhard de Jardin actually saw evolution as the rise of the eternal feminine. <clears throat> and if I could just put a short answer to your question. I do think relationality, by, by, by feminine, he meant uh, wisdom, relationship, light, um, a different locus of power, a different locus of authority that's coming from a, a shared beingness, an intersubjectivity. That is what's being resisted today by, a, by cultures, by societies that have been constructed on the male principles of a Newtonian mechanistic order. Uh, and so there, you see this resistance to evolution, this resistance to deep relationality. Uh, because it is, in a sense, a resistance to the feminine principle emerging in our midst. Um, but I, uh, this will not go away. Right, this is not going to, and I would, again, I might speculate that given sufficient amount of time uh, in, in generations to come, that we're going to see, we're moving quite honestly beyond genders. We're, I mean, if you're following the AI trends today, uh, we're moving to a, towards an agendering, towards a fluidity of gender. So again, I would take, you know, the younger generational um, understanding of gender, it's a different, it's a different rather than this male, female that has boxed us in and, you know, from the patriarchal side of things, caused top-down hierarchical structures of power that have left women really marginalized in many ways. I think we're going to move beyond that. And I think that's part and parcel of the evolutionary movement itself. And so I would just say stay tuned because up ahead is going to be a whole different type of species. Yeah. Um, should we move on now? OK, great. Cool. Microphone back then. Um, this thing. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> so uh, we talked then. So Teilhard, you know, let me just take a little survey here. How many people know about Teilhard de Jardin? Oh, we have a very enlightened group. Very good. So you know, just very quickly. He was a paleontologist, right? So his area of study was the Eocene era about 56 million years ago. He spent most of his life in China, <clears throat> outside the Western Hemisphere, and some, and some time in Africa, and very short amount of time in uh, the US. Um, he was French, so I know some of you have said his writings are difficult to understand. That's because he was French, and he was Jesuit. So two combinations there, right, make it difficult. Uh, he wrote in a certain period of time. You know, he has kind of a flowery kind of language, a kind of poetic, mythopoetic, but then he has this kind of, he's bringing science and theology together, but not in some a clear-cut systematic way. So a lot, of, a lot of people in theology kind of dismiss him. You know, he's not for real. You know, we can't take him too seriously. But his insights were tremendous and way ahead of the curve, way ahead of his time. He saw things that we're just beginning to realize today. Just to let you know that none of his writings on spirituality were published, were allowed to be published in his lifetime. So he had no opportunity to critique any of his writings. Uh, they were banned because he basically rejected original sin as it was conceived as an original fall. 
um, and that was he rejected it as a biologist and said it was inconsistent with biology. But he was also in, co in dialogue with many scientists of his age, and especially physicists. And he began to look at evolution as he looked at this movement of complexity. In other words, given sufficient amount of time, we've moved from single cell to multicellular, from prokaryotic to eukaryotic life, into organic life, into you know more complex organisms. And he says every time along the way with complexity, there's been a rise of consciousness. And so he posited that evolution is fundamentally a, a rise of consciousness. This is actually consonant with where what quantum physics has um, uh, disclosed in, our, in uh, our own age. Max Planck, one of the great physicists of, of the quantum era, says, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Uh, everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. So we have begun to talk about the hard problem, not only of consciousness, but the hard problem of matter. You can't get beyond matter and just talk about kind of pure consciousness and matter are deeply interconnected. So Schrodinger, again, another physicist, says consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms. For consciousness is absolutely fundamental. We can't even know anything about matter apart from consciousness. That's what they're saying, right? So it cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. Which makes then consciousness the primacy of everything that exists, including matter. <clears throat> and this is a radical shift in our thinking about things. For ages, we've talked about matter and spirit, or spirit emerging from matter, or consciousness emerging from matter. Now we're saying, no, matter emerges from consciousness. And we're like, huh? Really? Where did you get that stuff from? You know, and you know, we could even rewrite Genesis and say, you know, in the beginning was consciousness. In fact, maybe the name God points to that absolute knowing of everything, you know, which is much closer to the East than it is to the West. So consciousness, if we were to look at consciousness in terms of, say, uh, entangled energy or uh, a quantum wholeness, we can say that consciousness, you might say, is the wave side of the wave-particle duality, sort of the communication and the flow of information as waves are overlapping uh, or exchanging information. So. Consciousness, therefore, may be part and parcel of the cosmos. Now, we know that it requires an awareness, and we don't know what that means on the level of fundamental matter. That's what a lot of philosophers are grappling with today. Um, you know, but this idea of panpsychism, or the mind in nature, by, and I would distinguish, quite honestly, consciousness and mind. I take consciousness as the flow of information, and I take mind as the field of that informational flow, and I take the brain as the structure that processes that informational flow. So I take them as three interrelated terms, but not identical. But what we are saying is that what accounts for the human mind, then, is active in the universe. And that's why our minds matter to matter. What we are thinking about matters to matter. Our consciousness, our level of consciousness matters to matter. Because consciousness, in a sense, shapes matter. That's really what we're saying here. Um, and what we are saying is that it's in and through our minds, we are part of an undivided whole, our cosmos, our home. So if we are half conscious, if we have a part of our minds that's disconnected from the whole, then we only think. In fact, our whole is actually just a small part, right? Our whole is as wide as our minds. Our whole is as wide as our, our level of consciousness. Um, now, here's really what, Teilhard was a genius. He really was. He was prophetic, he was mystical, and extremely insightful. This is what he realized, is that everything that exists you know, whether it's a quark or a particle or a leaf or a star, everything has sort of a, what he called a withinness. There's something that's a property that's within or intrinsic to that that's thing. Um, because that, that kind of property of it is kind of that 
openness of the entity towards more beingness or more life or being part of something. But he says this, this property of withinness has another dimension of withoutness. And so he says everything that exists has a core energy that has two movements. Everything has a movement of withinness and a, a movement of withoutness, a movement of transcendence. In other words, I know you're not completely satisfied just sitting here. There's something about us that keeps we're longing for more insight, for more life, for a better world, for more unity. That's sort of our level of withinness constantly transcending. But that transcendence, how does it express itself? Towards what we're attracted to. And so what Teilhard saw is this level of withinness or consciousness has another dimension, the level of withoutness or love. Love, now love, let me just give a little thing here. Love has had a bad rap in the modern period, okay? You know, the Victorians, first of all, didn't do it such justice. And then we get to love as a sentiment, love as an emotion. Love that's become very superficial you know, in our culture. We fall in in love. We fall out of love. We can dust it off, you know. Uh, I don't love you. I love you. You know, we pick daisies. But love, what Teilhard said, is love is that center-to-center -center attraction, that deep-centeredness. It's that kind of mystical, as some we were talking last night about, why do people fall in love with this person and not that person, you know? You ever meet people and they go, oh, I found the love of my life, and you go, Seriously, what were they thinking about, you know? Right? So to the outsider who doesn't share that that deep center to center attraction, they're like, I don't get it, you know. Seriously. But you know, there's something there where the energy feels that the level of attractability is sort of an overflow of even the levels of consciousness. Because in a sense, love is not just looking at the same person, you know, the other person with two eyes, in a sense. There is something about a unitive there, a unitive nature, where now you're seeing life in the same direction. You know, so love is that force of attraction by which consciousness changes. And here, you don't have to be a scientist to figure that out. When you fall in love, your mind shifts, right? You see people awaken to a new reality. You know, you see people wake up to life in a whole new way. So love, you might say, is the outer dimension of that inner dimension of conscious transcendence. So to use Teilhard's language, the inner energy of attraction is the energy of transcendence. As I move towards something and I unite with it in that bond of love, my level of consciousness shifts by the very bondedness itself. In other words, the two, uh, to use our experience, become one, so to speak. We begin to see life together as two distinct entities now bonded. So Teilhard's notion, union differentiates. The more I'm in union with another, the more I am myself. That's what union does. Why relationality is important is because the full flowering of who I am is in relation to another. And so he developed a philosophy of love. He didn't develop it, in a sense, systematically, but he had insights. And they were very consonant with nature as science was now disclosing it. If, if the fundamental fabric of life is relational fields of energy, then reality is first unitive. Union, then, precedes a particular, particular distinction. So he says, uh, union, is attraction is prior to being. Well, again, think of the human level, right? How did we get here, right? We didn't just drop down from the sky. We emerge out of a union of love, right? And that's how we, in a sense, um, we, we, we further life by our unions of love. What we love, in a sense, what we become is what we give life to. So union is always towards more being, which means, first of all, Teilhard spoke of the universe as love energy. Now, that strikes the modern ear as something like right out of the 60s. You know, you want to see the fifth dimension pop on with Aquarius or something. You know, or the Beatles, all you need is love, love, love. Um, but what he's saying here is that the deepest energy of life is not just energy. In other words, it's not just 
a static or a dynamic energy, but it's an energy of attraction that is moving towards more uh, greater complex fields of attraction. So therefore, he says, even the notion to be, you know, there is no sense of just beingness. The beingness is being with. To be is to be with, right? But again, we can even reflect on our own experience. There's no such thing really as the isolated autonomous I. The I flows from relationality, whether it's that prim primordial relationality of God, the relationality of our parents, the relationality of our families, everything that forms the ego, the I, is out of fields of relationship. So reality is being with another um, in a way that's more open to union and more being. And therefore, since being is existence towards another, being is relational and exists for the sake of relationality, for giving, for being in relation to. So it, even to talk about ourselves as human beings uh, is not reflective of the true nature of our reality today. We should talk about ourselves as human interbeings. Now think about that in our political discourse. Think about that in our political discussions of immigration you know, of, you know, welcoming strangers into our midst. That we are on the fundamental levels of life. We are deeply related to one another. In fact, we kind of need one another to be ourselves. So, you know, as one author says, I do not exist in order that I may possess contra Newton or Descartes. Rather, I exist in order that I may give of myself for it is in giving that I am myself. And since this is why I think our culture today is going downward, because we're following just the opposite principles, right? We're saying, I exist in order that so I can possess. And the more I possess, the more I am myself. But actually, the more I possess, the more I actually fragment the fabric of life. I am unraveling what is nature, which means the more I possess, the more anti-natural I am. I am against the very principles of nature itself. So Teilhard speaks of love as a cosmological force. All of matter, from the Big Bang on, he says, is governed by love energy. How, this is how he accounts moving from, in a 13.8 billion year universe, from that quantum field of, of you know, photons to this amazing, you know, species that we call homo sapiens, who can think and love and, and do amazing things. Physical reality, he says, is governed by three things, attraction, uh, union, and emergence. What are we, and we can take this on the human level, what are we attracted to? How do we unite to that which we're attracted to? What, what is new that's emerging out of that attraction? So in terms of Teilhard's language, the force of love energy is present from the Big Bang onward, though indistinguishable from molecular forces. The whole universe, in his view, is grounded in love. Uh, that's a repeat. So he says, the physical structure of the universe is love. So it's not just energy. You know, the scientists, the pure scientists, would never go here, right? They're, they're never going to get their, their uh, language murky like this. This is just a no, no, no for science. But you'd have to, I mean, physicists today are sort of banging their heads against the wall to explain, you know, how we move from random particles or quantum wave duality into levels of complex dynamical systems that keep emerging. And Teilhard's saying, this is what love does. This is about love. So what does he come out with? Well, he puts this into a framework then. Uh, no, actually, I put this into a framework using Teilhard's. I take that back. Um, so what we're saying is evolution is the rise of withinness and withoutness. It's the rise of consciousness and love. And when we have only one half rising and the other, we fail to evolve. And when we're not evolving, we are devolving. 
we are either moving forward towards more complex unitive life or we are fragmenting the life that we have. So in Teilhard's view, this inner universe I take as consciousness, the outer universe as love. To say that as my levels of consciousness change, so too do my levels of love. My levels of love diminish because I detach myself from the world, so too do my levels of consciousness. I become smaller, smaller, smaller. Um, and this is, um, we're going to focus here on the second part. What Teilhard saw, by, by, by positing consciousness at the heart of the material universe, what he posited then is that religion, if religion is the binding, in other words, this ligament of all cosmic life towards you know, greater unity, then in a sense there is an absolute unity. There's something that keeps pulling the whole on towards uh, greater unity and complexity. So he says religion is biologically the necessary counterpart to the release of the Earth's spiritual energy. That is, religion has a biological function. And we're like, what? You know, the cosmos is religious? Seriously. But, you know, in a sense, in a sense, the ancients would not be too far afield here. They kind of got this in their own language, in their own thought patterns. We lost this in the modern period. And we have treated religion like it's a human phenomenon, like God just knows us humans, you know, and it's really all about us, and, and the, the rest of the whole thing is a stage. And, and Teilhard is like, no, the whole kit and caboodle is about a religious movement towards greater interiorization and greater subjectivity. So he says, Religion is part and parcel of cosmological and biological life. If we don't get religion, in a sense, aligned with the whole, the whole will seek its religious orientation somewhere else other than human. All right? So you just got to keep in mind that religion is part of the whole. It has an urge, uh, just as we have a longing, so too the whole of life has an urge or a longing for wholeness, for unity up ahead. So this is what you could see why no one read Teilhard or why they didn't publish him, right? So he's writing in the 30s that religion and evolution are destined to form one single continuous organism in which their respective lives prolong, are dependent on, and complete one another. You know, again, from the world of quantum physics today, uh, energy is the stuff of life. The whole has, has, you might say, a spiritual longing. Materiality is spirituality stretching forth towards more unity in that fullness, you know, of what we can call love. And so this is, we're like, hmm, the stars stretch, mm-hmm. The planets stretch, yep, planets stretch, uh, amoebas stretch, bacteria stretch. But they stretch, then they have to transcend their limits, right? That's what evolution's about. We transcend the limits of the stretch towards more stretching, right? That's what love does. It keeps pulling us on to more. Therefore, Teilhard says, look, you know, all right, I get it. The Jesuits don't really like me. The church doesn't really like me. But uh, I got to keep going here. He saw that... If we are really to move towards the fullness of life, we have to rethink just about everything. So at one point he said, well, who will give evolution its own God? Of course, I read that and I said, well, I think I'll give it a try, you know, since not too many are thinking along these lines. It's a really important question for us. Who will give evolution its own God? We talk God language across centuries as if God is like a static baseline, you know, God, mm, you know, from fifth right into the 21st century. But as Raymond Panikar reminds us, theology and cosmology are deeply intertwined. There's no cosmos without God and no God without cosmos. And therefore, the, our, you know, again, you know, cosmology is, in a sense, a reflector, a mirror 
of, in a sense, this mystery of divinity that we name as God. So Teilhard begins to rethink this himself, and he said, look, you know, how do we explain this, even from the point of evolution, how life keeps moving towards greater novelty? Uh, and it's hard to explain just on its own. Uh, in fact, truthfully, we don't really like to change. You know, if you look at our day-to-day -day lives, right, change is hard for us. And he said, basically, there is, you know, nature itself seems to kind of fall into stable patterns. So he said, what's at the heart of this evolutionary process? And he says, it can't be another nature. It has to be something other than nature. Here he's influenced by the philosopher Henri Bergson who said there's something, at a, a transcendent otherness at the heart of nature that impels nature towards more being. And so Teilhard called this omega. It's a term he got, you know, from scripture. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And so he sees that omega as autonomous, uh, deeply centrated, and deeply within everything that exists. And basically what he's saying is that God is that omega, that the, the God, you know, who we pray to up there is here. This God is here. This God is completely other than but within. You know, God at the heart of everything that exists. God at the heart of the quarks, of the cells, of the atoms. God at the heart of the neurons and the amoebas and the bacteria and the rabbits and human persons. And so... You know, this God is, in a sense, what Thomas Merton alluded to, you know, in his, um, when, he, when he, he himself came to this insight that at the center of our being is a point of nothingness, sort of that, that which is untouched by sin and by illusion, a point of pure truth, a spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, but which God disposes our lives which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our mind, the brutalities of our own will. But this little point of nothing in us is our poverty. This is the pure glory of God in us, omega within us, that which is inaccessible and yet the very power of our lives. And Merton goes on to say, if we could see this in every single person, the world would be illumined, illuminated like a dazzling brilliance of light. You know, and so what Teilhard recognizes that we have thought of God too much as a prime mover, right? The God, you know, Aristotle's God, someone who sets things in motion. And this God is old, right? A God who does things in the past. And oftentimes when we use God language, we have this side of implicit notion like, well, God made us, you know, God made him, and now we have to just work our way back to God, right? So God made us, here we are, and we've got to get back to God. And what Terry said is, no, <clears throat> that's not the living God. That, that's not a God of an evolutionary universe. This is a God, you know, who's within us and ahead because God is God. God is not us. That's the beauty, by the way right? Thank God that God is God, because it's that transcendent otherness of the divine that is deeply within. <clears throat> and, you know, and even the, I don't know, God language, it's too controllable. You know, we think we've got God in our hands. You know, he's got the whole world in his hand, but we've got the whole of God in our hands. You know, we know the way we argue about God, the way we have discussions about God, like logical discussions, unlike serious you're logically explaining God, who is incomprehensible mystery, absolutely transcendent mystery, you know, and yet a mystery that is deeply at the heart of our lives, which makes not God the mystery so much as we are the mystery, the human person. We don't even know the depth of our lives. And so the God within <clears throat> is the God ahead. This is a God, as Pondenberg says, this is the God of the future. This is a God who's calling us from the future and drawing us on to more being and life. So, <clears throat> excuse me, a little time out here for water. <clears throat> I think, you know, we, we're familiar with classical theism. <clears throat> These two separate orders, God above creation here. 
But we're talking about a process theism, because process, I think process thought is more consonant with what physics is telling us today about systems and interrelationality. And what we're saying is divine being and created being share a relationship. <clears throat> we're sort of in this whole together. Okay, we have a station, we have a <clears throat> clear the throat. We must be in the mountains. <clears throat> <coughs> I get all choked up about this, by the way, too. So, <coughs> um, so the type of theology I think that Teilhard alludes to is <coughs> what we might call a panentheism. <coughs> God is in the world, and the world is in God, but God is not the world, and the world is not God, right? So God is more than the world. In a sense, some people, scholars, even talk about us within, unfolding within the life of the God as, tri as Trinity, <clears throat> which, you know, makes us, in a sense, part of that life of God, as God's life is deeply integrated with ours. So the way I might conceive this is the classical view, you know, version of God, <clears throat> bene <clears throat> wow, benevolently hovering over us, rather than a God who is emerging from a rise of consciousness as we awaken to a transcendent nature. The God within, from the beginning, in a sense, rising up as, as, as life becomes more conscious, more deeply in love. Then God, in a sense, begins to shine out more as that divine within and the divine ahead. <clears throat> and so love, in a sense, is the name of the game. Love <clears throat> is, in a sense, that expression of consciousness in the direction of attraction. <clears throat> so we are saying, which is consonant with the New Testament, that God, first of all, is not a static being. God is certainly not a male static being, right? God does not know gender, by the way. <clears throat> I think he's like, well, whatever. You know, he's okay. You know, she's okay. God's okay. We need new language, by the way, I think. Uh, love is a good language, you know, because that's very consonant. God is love. But love, you know, when we say that, I think we think of love, you know, Aristotle would say, or Thomas Aquinas, love is a relation of God. God's being is self-subsistent. I'm God, and I love you. You know, it's a relation. But Teilhard is not saying that. He's saying... In fact, I think what the New Testament is saying is, no, God's, love is not just a relation to God's self-enclosed being. Love is what God is. <clears throat> there is no other God but love. And that's why I think the New Testament is shocks us, really. But we so domesticated the whole thing that it's like, oh, yeah, God is Trinity, you know. But Trinity means that love is plural, right? You can't be all by yourself in your little room. I, I love you you know, as an idea. Love is concrete. Love extends itself. It flows into another, right? So God is relational. God is a fountain fullness of love. The absoluteness of God is the absolute fountain fullness of love that no human mind could co possibly even come near to understanding. The infinity of that love expressed uh, in one other than God, in an in, in image of God, in a word of God that we name as Son, a second divine person. And therefore, that flow of love, you know, from it, with just the life of God from one to the other, bound in a breath of love, because we know when you are in love, there is something so real between you, it's like another person. It's a spirituality of bondedness. And that's the spirit, that breath of love. And so God is a dynamic community of love. You know, not just like, and I do like Rublev, but, you know, I mean, you know, to put this bluntly, like three men at a tea party, you know, which is how we, but we use the language of Trinity. We don't know, we haven't a clue what we're talking about, right? You know, we're like, oh, yeah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, but then we, we like language of God because it's just easier and we get our heads around that. Trinity, we don't know what to do with. But what we are saying is that God is constantly self-emptying, self-communicative, self-expressing. And that expression 
is in word and world. Everything that exists, in a sense, is an expression of that love of God. And that breath of the Spirit is constantly flowing through us. We are Trinitarian outflows of divine love. And so God is relational. God is canonic. God is self-emptying. And by self-emptying, we don't mean God like, you know, God's not like a poker player. You know, I'll give you two-thirds, keep a third for myself just in case it doesn't go well. You know, but God is the complete, complete gift of love. And we have a hard time with that. Students were like, I mean, students would say to me, really? God gives everything away? And I'm like, mm-hmm, the whole kit and caboodle. And they're like, how is that possible? Well, you're not God. I mean, you know, that's the whole thing. So you can't do that. You can, you can give yourself away. Yeah, but guess what? When you give yourself away, you become something more than yourself, don't you? You become something other. Uh, you begin to live in a new way. So God is canonic, and in that kenosis, right, there's something of God within us that longs for that. So what? The self-emptying is, in a sense, a being drawn to. It's a dynamic. It's a falling in love over and over again. I think that's really what God's about. God is falling in love over and over again with this dynamic life we call cosmos, and, and here we are immersed in this process. So this, this outward moving personal gift of divine love is, in a sense, I think, what keeps drawing us onward. Whether we're atheists or nuns or whatever, there's something that keeps pulling us towards, you know, towards more knowing, towards more being, towards more fullness in love. A relational God empowering a relational universe. Here's an image of a brain cell, a neuron. Here's the image from NASA of the universe. So it's, it's startling the way science today is even becoming closer to what the New Testament, you know, has uh, disclosed about God. I think, you know, again, um, we have to think of God as the dynamism of love. A love that is so deeply within us that this love will never fail. The only thing that can fail is us. We can refuse to accept this God. We can reject this God. We can make believe we have another God. But this is a God, in a sense, who consistently loves to do new things. Um, you know, my, Meister Eckhart, the uh, wonderful Dominican mystic, said, you know, God is the newest thing there is, the youngest thing. And when we are united to God, we become new again. And what he's saying is that God is always the horizon of new life. How can we say, yeah, we're all for God and want to hold on to the old? We want, we want to stay in that 16th century. Uh, we're not, you know, there's a very fine line, I think, between the living God and the Freudian projection of God. My deep fears, my deep, you know, my deep misgivings projected now. This is what I think God is. The only way we can know God is if we know life. If, and we know life by we know what nature is, in a sense, you know, and reflecting on that. And so it does bring us then into the question, certainly from the Christian side of things. Look, you know, we're in a universe that is being, we can, from the point of God, we can say, loved into being. Uh, you know, God's, God's promise, I am with you always. Uh, and maybe that's what evolution will be, an endless creativity in love. And so I do imagine at some point that we are going to move beyond Homo sapiens. We'll be in the American Museum of History one day. And they'll say, well, look at that. Look what they wore. And, you know, they actually had phones in and stuff. You know, but we have to really begin to rethink what is our Christian story now in, in an open universe, in an unfinished universe. And so we are moving into what I've called second axial period theology. We can't keep doing theology out of the first axial period. It, it's no longer consonant, um, which means we have to rethink what is the meaning of Jesus as the Christ. Right? And so, so, so we just know, I know some of you have heard this before, that Christ is not Jesus' surname, right? You know, he's the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. When I was growing up, I, I was pretty sure that's what it was. 
you know, because that's how we treat Jesus, like Jesus Christ, Ilya Delio, you know. But is Jesus the Christ, right? So Jesus of Nazareth given the title the Christ by the early church. Yeah, you know, he's the Messiah. He's the one, he's the long for promised one. What does that mean now for us in our own age? So Teilhard recognized, look, we are so behind the, we are so behind the times here. He says, we are in the cusp of a new humanism, a new neo-humanism. And he says, what is it? What a neo-humanism that looks to the future must have is nothing less than a more profound Christianity rethought to fit the new dimensions of the world. Now, some people have said, ah, oh, there he is, you know, a Catholic Jesuit, all touting Christianity, but it's a world of religious pluralism. But I do think he, he has insights that can be beneficial to us today. For one thing, he's saying, look, the human world of today has not grown cold, but it is ardently searching for a God proportionate to the newly discovered immensities of a universe whose aspect exceeds the present compass of our power of worship. Again, from the Catholic side, you know, we have beautiful prayers <clears throat> in the Catholic liturgy. They're from the 5th and 6th century, uh, maybe from the 14th as well, you know. But I don't think we go beyond 14th. And yet liturgy, <clears throat> liturgy is the gathering together, the ecclesia, you know, to give, to give, not only to give praise and glory to God, but to empower us in our God-centered lives to contribute to this world in its evolution towards a God-centeredness in love. You know, and when lit liturgy doesn't do that for us, we have to, you know, ask, what are we doing? It becomes so rote and mechanistic. You know, it's Sunday, 9 o'clock, got to go to church, you know. So we move in there. I hope this isn't more than an hour, you know, because I have a very busy day. So, you know, and it's that kind of mechanistic mentality. Like we're showing up just so we can check in with God, you know, like check off. So God, you know, and I think in the bottom of my back of my mind, we're like, hey, if I die, God's going to know I went to church on Sunday. You know, it's going to be A-OK. -okay. We're going to slide right in there to heaven. And I'm like, <clears throat> Teilhard saw this as a problem of increasing irrelevance. He said, you know, first of all, as modern science emerged from geocentrism to heliocentrism, it led to the isolation of theology from science, and we have lost, in a sense, scope of God's power and the fact that love is at the heart of the cosmos. So all of this to say is that our Christology is in real some need of, you know, rethinking. And, you know, first uh, thought is, why Jesus? You know, why the incarnation? And I think, you know, again, Protestant Catholic alike, we've had, we have the story, right? God created a beautiful garden. You know, it was original blessing, original grace. Uh, and then, you know, move to chapter 2, by the way. You have two people there, Adam. Oh, you have Adam, and then you have Eve created out of the rib of Adam, right? So we have the image of God, Adam, and then the incomplete image of the image of God. That would be Eve. So needless to say, thanks to Aristotle and others, you know, we could then surmise that poor Eve, since she couldn't have, she didn't have a fully functioned intellect, would be deceived by, you know, Satan and would then eat the apple that's never mentioned, of course, in the, you know, of the forbidden tree. And we know that story, right? We tell it over and over and over again. Because we are our stories. We are our religious stories. And so why, why Jesus? Because we fell into sin, death entered in, and we couldn't save ourselves. Only God could save us. And so, therefore, why the God-man? To repay the debt incurred by human sin. And we have spent a lot of our lives focused on sin, guilt, and death. You know? But there have been theologians who said, seriously? Really? Like, God became incarnate because of a defect in creation? Uh, and from, you know, I think we can say even a little bit in Irenaeus of Lyon, you know, through Rupert of Deutz into the 14th century and Duns Scotus. That God is love. And from all eternity, God, God loves to love, right? And he willed a finite creature to grace and glory, whether or not sin ever existed. 
And Christ, therefore, is the first in God's intention to love. What God loved, wanted to do from all eternity is to share that love with a creature, will to grace and glory. So we have the difference between original sin and original love. Um, and therefore, the Franciscan side of things, you know, is on love. And just so you know, that Teilhard discovered Duns Scotus rather late in life. He was like, it was like 1950, from a Franciscan, by the way. And when he heard it, he said, there it is. There's the theology of the future. Well, I think, you know, had Teilhard found the Franciscan Duns Scotus earlier, he would have been Teilhard OFM, not SJ. He would have been a Franciscan, and we would have published all his writings. We would have known a lot more. Anyway, what Teilhard, in a sense, is saying here, and this, I think, is important for us to keep in mind. You know, Christianity is not really a new religion. Uh, Jesus did not come to, to find a new church. He really came as a Jew. Uh, and he came, in a sense, as a faithful Jew who wanted to, in a sense, restore that lost, that, you know, house of Israel that was getting all caught up in juridical laws, in duty, you know, and, and losing sight of the human person and community. And so what Teilhard says is Christianity is not normative of religion. It's really normative of evolution. It's normative of community and of unity and of building up in love and compassion. So he sees Christianity as a fulfilling an essential function in evolution. Now, that leads us then to understand, well, what is God in relation to evolution? And I think here's the most radical thing about Christianity. But, you know, we, we, go, we grow so accustomed to the story that it just seems like, yeah, what's the big deal? You know, God becomes flesh. You know, the word, God, self-emptying into finite, physical, created reality. The word becoming evolution, if we take Scotus's position, from the beginning, word incarnate, from the beginning of the Big Bang. So the word becomes Big Bang. And, you know, other religions are like, that is scandalous. To say that divinity enters into materiality, that's outrageous. Um, and yet, that's what Teilhard says, you know, and what Christians say, the self of God is in the self-emptying of God. No God up there that's not here. It's called mystery, right? That God can completely become element and draw every element uh, into a greater fullness of being through love. So God is not found through opposition to matter, pace the Gnostics, or independent of matter, pace the Newtonians or, or Cartesians, but through matter, welcome to Christianity, right? We take hold of God in and through the finite. And therefore, from a Christian perspective, using Scotus's notion that this whole kit and caboodle is grounded in love, in the incarnation of love, that Christ is first in God's intention to love, therefore, this whole cosmos is about original love moving into the fullness of love. And Teilhard called this not just Christ. In other words, the language is too static. This is a dynamic process of incarnating love. Love in the quarks, love in the stars, love in the planets, love in the bacteria, love into you know, small creatures, moving into larger creatures. This whole thing, he says, is a birthing of the Christ, the birthing of that unity of divine love incarnate. So he sees creation, incarnation, and redemption not as three separate movements. I said we split them up so we can get a theology degree. So we do that three years, you know, creation, incarnation, redemption. Actually, God's creating, I mean, the patristics were great on this, right? The artist, the artist is in the art, right? I can tell a Picasso painting pretty much by, you know, I, I can kind of tell Picasso by the painting. You know, same idea. God is in the art of creation. Uh, as God creates, God enters into that which create. God creates. God binds himself to it, incarnates. And as God becomes incarnate, creation is reconciled with God. It's already redeemed. We don't have to become redeemed. We are redeemed by the very fact of incarnation. So this is a personal universe. God loves 
every single being in its unique beingness. God speaking God's heart in the rich diversity of creation. In a sense, everything that exists is a little word of God. You know, we are speaking God throughout all of creation, not just Christians. Every person, every color, every nationality, every religion, is, from a Christian perspective, is speaking the word of God. You know, so this is deep incarnation. God gets into the tissue of cosmic and biological life and loves everything in its beingness unto the fullness of being. Now, Teilhard was a radical thinker, and he said, look, this is not just divinity and humanity coming into union, you know, as our Chalcedon formula uh, tells us. But if we take this, this primacy of Christ, like from the beginning, divine love is incarnating, then there's a third nature to Christ, what he called the cosmic nature. So Christ is related, he said, not just juridically. Christ is not just, you know, the one who saves us from sin. Christ is organically the mover of evolution. Christ is, in a sense, in that third nature, the evolver itself. And so he sees that this God Omega, you know, at the heart of evolution, is really Christ Omega, incarnate love. This otherness of divine love empowering evolution towards more fullness in love. And so, you know, this is hard sometimes because, again, when we have grown up and have been wired with stories of Jesus, you know, they're beautiful, you know, but we'd have to admit, if we're following the story, that the humanity of Jesus emerges out of cosmic and biological evolution. Right? The carbon in Jesus' blood was the carbon in the stars, just as it is in ours. You know, the, the hydrogen and the nitrogen in Jesus is the same that's in ours from, from the cosmic elements. And so Jesus is truly a cosmic person uh, before he is a biological person, before he is then named as the Son of God. So Christogenesis, the birthing of the Christ, as we're moving towards something more whole, more being in union with God. So as, you know, my friend Dennis Edwards says, you know, Christ is not the great exception to the universe, but the climax of a long development where the world becomes aware of itself now in the direct presence of God. In a sense, we can say this, that God is knowing and loving all along. You know, a lot of scripture, we could find a lot of scripture to support this. I know you. I love you. I am with you you know, and in a sense that kind of knowing, loving comes to an explicit awareness in this person, Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, he is human, right? He's truly human. He's born, you know, in a little, a uh, quiet little family. We got the story, Jesus, I mean, Mary pregnant, uh, Mary, you know, Joseph willing to betroth her. They go off to a, a little humble place because, you know, they're unusual circumstances. Um, they're Jewish, right? They're faithful to the Jewish law. They don't want to be upstarts. They don't want to be thrown out. Uh, but, you know, they give birth to this tiny babe in the hidden manger. You know, we do love Christmas, right? We're all there for Christmas. Um, and it's great. I, mean, I love Christmas. Everyone loves Christmas, by the way. You know, you don't have to be Christian. Today, I think, you know, every, I mean, Sears loves Christmas. Walmart loves Christmas. Jews love Christmas. You know, atheists love Christmas. We love to give gifts. We love relationships. Right? So Jesus comes on the scene. And what is he? Deeply relational, right? When he enters his public ministry. But let, let's get this, let's, let's be clear. Jesus was no just stay at home boy, right? When he comes on the scene, he doesn't have like a logical philosophical argument. He walks into the temple and he does daring things. He walks up and he starts to read from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Whoa, who is this guy? You know? And they're like, isn't he the boy from Nazareth or whatever? You know, the carpenter's son? And they're like, sit him down. Um, you know, he has a new consciousness. Jesus comes on the scene with a new structure of consciousness, a new awareness. He is Jewish, faithful to the law, and yet he is challenging that law, which in a sense uh, obscures the vision of what God is doing in our midst.
And I think what we find in Jesus not only is a deeply rooted God consciousness, his deep sense of Abba, you know, this deep sense of filiation, but he has an inner freedom. And faith in God, in a sense, accept, you know, frees him to accept his responsibility. In a sense, he feels compelled, you know, to, to speak now um, of the reign of God. And so I think what we find with Jesus is a sense of newness, not oldness. You know, he's, they didn't get him, right? If you read the scriptures, they're like, wow, the reign of God is now. It's, it's within you. The reign of God is here. The Jews were expecting it there. You know, it'll come, but we just need a little time so we can prepare. And Jesus is not, no, open your eyes, kids, right? You know, um, something new is happening. God is breaking in. And they're like, we, we, we're attracted to what he's saying, but we don't really trust this guy. You know, I, we kind of like him, but we don't. We see in Jesus a new direction. Moving towards what? Community, compassion, peace, forgiveness, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, we take that, oh, if I give all my stuff to Salvation Army, I should get in pretty soon, you know? No, not the material poor, the spiritual poor, the one who recognizes one's dependence on God. Who, wants, who, who's no, who knows one's being flows from God. You know, a, Jesus is saying that this newness now of an awakening in that God presence must bring to us a new mind and a new heart, and therefore a new power to love, a new creativity. Jesus is a whole maker. I do like to ask the question, you know, was Jesus Catholic? So... You know, many people, of course, <laughs> you know, many people say, oh, yeah, Jesus was Catholic, but his mother was Jewish. They come from an ecumenical family. Now, he was Jewish, right? So, he, but he has a spirit of homemaking. Now, just for the record, we know that the word Catholic was not invented by Catholics, right? It was borrowed from the Greeks, who were pagans. And the word katholikos means according to the whole, having a sense of the whole. So it was a good word to import by, you know, um, I think it was Ignatius of Antioch uh, who imported that word, katholikos. You know, there's a sense of the whole. Jesus was Catholic in the sense, small c. He was a whole maker, right? And I do think this is what salvation is about. It's about healing. Like, you know, in the early church, Jesus was known as the physician, the healer. We need to be healed of our inner divisions. We need to be healed of the violence within our hearts. The grace that makes us whole is the grace, is the love that flows through our lives that helps make the world whole. A healthy life for a healthy world. You know, in a sense, Jesus, I mean, we, we read the stories where he's reaching out across boundaries over and over again to Samaritans, to women, to outsiders, you know, he did not see a separation between himself and uh, any other person. He accepts from them. He takes that drink of water from the woman at the well. This was scandalous, right, to his disciples. Do you know who you're talking to? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I like her water. It's good, you know. Um, he saw that all human beings are part and parcel of the whole of which he was a part of. So here's the thing. We have been just too mechanized about Jesus and Christianity. Like, how hum we're Christians. Like, we're saved. Oh, seriously, really, get a life, would you? Uh, we're no more saved than, you know, than anyone else. But we are on our way to becoming whole, right? That is our hope, that we will be healed of our inner divisions, that we will be, in a sense, created into love for the sake of love. So first of all, we have to recognize that to be a Christian is to be a cyborg. You know, Jesus was a cyborg, right? A cyborg, borrowed from contemporary culture, is a cybernetic organism. It means that, you know, what we are can be hybridized. It can be joined to something else. 
Jesus was fully cyberized, right? He was truly joined to, one with divinity. That is our faith claim. Jesus truly one with God, one with humanity. We could say one with cosmos. But we too are called to that union with God. Um, Jesus was a mutation. This is not my word, someone else's. Um, it's a radicalization of love. He doesn't just do what's biologically necessary, you know, to maintain the status quo. He goes beyond. He is, in a sense, the self-gifting love because he, he feels himself to be part of something more than himself. Jesus, therefore, and I do think Christianity follows chaos theory. Jesus was really a strange attractor, right? You know, again, here's the, the, the little Jewish boy. Uh, he comes on the scene and he says some outrageous things and does some outrageous practices, but it's like he's upturning the apple cart, but he's also charismatic. He's attracting a new field, a new pattern of a God-centeredness. And so he's sort of like, you know, he's sort of within Judaism, but different from it. And as this pattern begins to grow, you know, it begins to form a fractal. Christian life is really fractal life. We're Christic fractals as we begin to take on this pattern of Jesus's, you know, uh, life. Uh, this, this sense of compassion and peace and love and forgiveness. But to do that, Jesus had a deep center of inner freedom. And this is where I think our modern world really, in a sense, works against us. One thing is, we're not free. We may have our political liberties, we may have our cultural liberties, we do not have inner freedom. And you see this in the anxieties of the culture. You see this in the obsessiveness of the culture. The need that often uh, shows itself up in consumerism. The need to have more, more, more. We don't even know why we're buying so much stuff sometimes. But there's something compulsive about us because there's something not free within us. Jesus was truly free. And therefore, I think what Jesus is about, I think what Christian life is about, is not just following Jesus or doing what Jesus does. We are to become new structures of biological existence. That's following the pattern of Jesus to move this whole kit and caboodle forth into more being in love. And so, again, Jesus shows us the, the, the center of living freedom must be an inner freedom. The I am, may you be, right? The I, you know, that we are deeply connected. We're related on a deep sense of life. Be, and guess what? God's not done with us. God's not done with me, and God's not done with you, and God is creating something in our lives together. So that's it. You know, we're saying we're on a, a level of trajectory. Christianity is a hybridized religion uh, that's based on creativity and future. Uh, but what Jesus said is, hey, you know, not only is the reign of God within you, and not only are you to do what I do, you are to go beyond it. That's the life of a, a Trinitarian God, a God who is breathing a dynamic love in us. Jesus is the way, but now we are to follow, in a sense, to breathe that life in and through us. We are the Christ, Right? If the world says this Christian stuff is ridiculous, look at them. They're always at war. You know, they're constantly fighting with one another, uh, constantly polarized. And the world says, I don't buy this Christian stuff. You know, this seems ridiculous. And that's because if we fail to live that Christ life in our lives, then the world fails to see what this union in love might look like. Right? So the whole kit and caboodle really is built on resurrection. I mean, again, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, St. Paul says, then our faith, I mean, I'm the most ridiculous of people. Why would I even believe, you know, that God has become flesh and now we're just believing like in a myth of, of a guy who died and we can't find his body, you know, but we have a powerful, and it's belief, right? There are no literal eyewitnesses to the resurrection. It's based on the experience of the risen Christ. And who's the first one who might have been there when the soul was roamed away? 
Mary Magdalene. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just so we get, get the story straight. So, right, women there, right? Birthing, birthing of something new. The experience of a new consciousness. And Jesus doesn't say, great, Mary, good to see you again. You know, please, don't, don't mention this to anyone, okay? No, just the opposite. Go, you know, with your, you know, you have seen, you have experienced. Now go and announce, tell the others what you have seen. Of course, the men didn't believe her, right? You know, are you kidding? Women, they always make this stuff up. So resurrection is what the name of the game. We are to be Easter people. But again, uh, you might have heard this, but I go to Easter liturgies. Sometimes they're good. Again, we love Christmas. It's already beginning, right? So we're getting up to Thanksgiving, Christmas now. Christmas trees, gifts are already here. It'll end the evening of December 25th. Uh, resurrections, like we go through Lent, you know, we go through this dark period. Yeah, okay, we're going to give up chocolate. We're going to give up television. You know, we know that we have to prepare for uh, the cross, the event of the cross, and then, you know, Easter. So we go through Good Friday, and it's Good Friday, you know, because, you know, it's like Jesus has died for my sins, you know, and I'm Jesus will save me. Uh, but really, Good Friday is really about the power of God's love, that God loves us so much that God has loved us unto death. But God cannot be conquered by death. God's love in a sense, works through that death into new life. And therefore, we come to Easter Sunday. So we say, the Lord be with you. know, First of all, by the way, I've got to bring in Adam, right? Because it's mea, oh, mea culpa, mea culpa. If Adam had not sinned, Christ would not have come. Thank God for sin. You know, I knew something good would come out of it. So we got, we got resurrection, right? And therefore, we're like, yay for sin. Uh, the Lord is risen. Alleluia. You know, go in peace. Have a nice Sunday. Um, that's it. That's it. But guess what? Every service, every time we're coming together in that power of the name Jesus, we should be people of the resurrection, right? We're people of evolution. We're people that we're saying, no, this is not it. That there is new life. We're about new life in God. We're about now creating something in a new way, a new heaven and a new earth. God does not promise a new heaven without earth. God promises a new heaven with earth. But again, we've made heaven like the opposite of earth. That is not consonant with scripture. Uh, heaven is, the you might say, the flip side when earth is open to God. That's where heaven unfolds. So resurrection, and we know if you study the early church, they were people of the resurrection. They believed in the power of the risen Lord. Nothing could stop them. They would throw themselves to the lions. They'll go to the Colosseums. Because physical life is really, you might say, just an openness to that fullness of life, you know, in God. So we're meant to have a new basis, new structure of consciousness, a new sense of selfhood, a new sense of what it means to belong to the cosmos. It's not same old, same old. Christianity is about newness, it's about creativity, and it's about future. So, you know, as one writer says, the resurrection of Jesus speaks of a new future for the whole, the invasion of the present by the power of what, that which is yet to come. We are, in a sense, to be futurists. We know, we trust, we believe that our lives, our humanity now lives in a new way in God, that all of cosmic life will find a new, a new relatedness in God. So as Thomas Merton says, you know, we must contain all divided worlds in ourselves and transcend them in Christ. And what have we done? We have made Christ the division of our worlds. And so we haven't really lived this Christian story. We haven't really fully grasped the fact that the whole of it is Christogenesis. The whole Big Bang universe is suffering, death, and resurrection, even if you didn't want to believe in religion and you were really taking note of evolution, you'd have to really wonder, what are we doing here? How did, we, how did life not become extinct, you know, millennia ago with the cosmic cataclysms, you know, the asteroid um, invasions, biological life, vast extinctions? 
you know, geological uprisings. And here we are. There's something at the heart of life. Even when it's all destroyed, that power will push it onwards towards something that's more unified, more complex, more being in love. So we, this is actually a universe that leans on the future. And from a Christian perspective, we're saying that future is God. God is not just in the future. God is the future. And that future is the absolute fullness of love. And that's a no-fail love. We can fail. We can wipe ourselves out. That, that's, that's a possibility. God has all the time in the world. God will be God until endless ages. And that God is love. And so what we have to really kind of get our hands around is Christianity is a religion of evolution. We are to be the evolvers, and we are to be the evolvers in love towards the greater fullness of love. How will we get there? That will be our third story. Thanks. Yeah, we have a little time before lunch for some Q&A. So thoughts, questions, concerns? Yes, we have a question. Okay. Thanks. Um, this brings to my mind, like, with, with this dynamic evolution of Christianity, how can anyone resist that? How can one deny that? How can one not partake of it? It is, it, it, it is a, a mysterious uh, a power that, how can you possibly resist that? You may say in your mind, in your false self, I don't believe that, or that it's not for me. How can you believe that? How can you not partake of it? Right. So, I mean, you know, that speak, you speak to me of someone who is open then to life. And I do think uh, part of the resistance to the, the, the evolutionary story is the fear of what this openness to newness might mean for us. Uh, you know, the brain is a funny thing. The brain can capture certain ideas and sort of imprison them. Um, and the way, in other words, the brain can sort of shut itself off to the openness to the fullness of life. It can do that. And that, you know, again, that's part of the mystery of being human, uh, that we can kind of shut down. It does require, in a sense, a trust in the process of life itself, and at that process of life is one that we name God, you know, that absolute div divine wholeness in love. Um, it's a, it's a, it is calling forth a surrender of our entrenched beliefs. Uh, it's calling us to lay aside our fixed notions of God. It's calling us to tell new stories because a lot of what we know about God and creation are based on stories we have told generation after generation after generation. And so we're wired to think in this way. But we have to tell a new story. And therefore, we need, in a sense, to tell that new story over and over and over again. We need new art with that story. We need new symbols. We need new language. We need new songs, you know, new, new, new music. And so, it, <laughs> and so we need the artists. We need to develop the aesthetic side of an evolutionary Christian story. It's not just the intellectual side. So we have, to do, we have to kind of realign ourselves, first on the level of nature, then on the level of understanding, then on the level of faith, and then on the level of aesthetics. We have a lot of work to do. You know? So it's a lot easier just to say, oh, no, I'm sticking with the old stuff. Just easier, right? I get the impression that uh, uh, from your presentation that the omega point is inevitable. If the omega point is inevitable, why wouldn't we just sit back and let it come to us? Because it's not. 
because with, where there is absolute love, there is absolute freedom. We can reject love. And that's from God's side, it, you know, and by, let me, there's two things I want to respond to that, Jim. Uh, by point, I, I, I don't, I refrain from using the language of omega point because it sounds like something we're going to arrive at in a deterministic way. That, I don't think that's really what Teilhard had in mind. Uh, by omega, he meant the fullness in love. And his thought here is not too different from, say, Bonaventure. In other words, the, the cosmic Christ as that fullness of all things in love will be in the richness of the diversity, in the relationality of all things in love. It's more a process than a determination of arriving at something. But the fact is, we can reject that process. We can say, I'm not buying into this love thing. You know, I'm not buying into this cosmic Christology. So that's number one. A second thing is, as a process in an unfinished universe, the omega point may itself be the very openness to creativity and greater unity and love. That's omega. So rather than thinking of omega point as something static, you have to think of it as something dynamic. That itself is the unitization of, of evolution um, and not just simply an arrival at. Until, until that happens uh, in totality, uh, uh, there's a price to be paid. Uh, uh, Jesus' example of that, dying on the cross, and, and, and others, uh, the Buddha, for instance, uh, who I suspect uh, had the same experience and the same insights, although he didn't understand it the way we do. But, uh, uh, and St. Francis and, and others that pay a price if they want to be where you're talking about. In my oh, opinion. yes, absolutely. Uh, th in other words, this is self-involvement, right? It's a, it's a self-involving love. You can't just say, like, love in word. It's, it's the co total kenosis of our lives. In other words, we lose ourselves into something more than ourselves uh, because we are part of something more. Um, and therefore, in that in that kenosis of being, we, in a sense, enter into the greater fullness of being. And that is then moving into the fullness of Christ, right? That love becomes incarnate in us. Here, here. Oh, here, here, okay. You, you spoke of uh, we needing a new language. And, and I'm, I'm always amazed at how important language is. And I have a very difficult time um, moving into the essence and, and the deepest meaning and so on of all that you're saying, when we're still using the language, the word, right. God. And my question is, can, can you conceive of giving this lecture, writing your book, without using the word God? Yeah, I could. I mean, you know... Uh, I, 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 truthfully, let me tell you personally, I don't mind language God. I mean, because I have an understanding of God that's personal, and so I don't think of the great guy in the sky thing. But, you know, I can see the limits of the language. Um, we might think of it, uh, to use Ponycar's language, as a cosmotheandrism, uh, or a theandric whole, or, or um, a theodivinization. You know, we might think of, we might just think of it, as, to use Teilhard's language, of amorization. You know, it is an amorizing process. What is the language that best reflects your experience of divinity? You know, of this divine, you know, uh, absolute love at the heart of life. And the language that best experiences that will be the language probably you should use, you know, because that's the language that's making this, this relationship alive for you. But right now, given where we are in the state of things, I, I mean, I'm going to keep the language God because at least it connects me to a, a larger audience. But not everyone is there, but I do appreciate exactly that thing. And I think, quite honestly, given enough time, as we do emerge, and I do think we will emerge into a different level of religious consciousness and therefore a different sense of religious convergence. As the world religions, uh, uh, as we evolve, into something up ahead, we will find new language for the new that will be emerging through us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah so, yeah. Uh, uh, needless to say, uh, evolutionary scientists such as Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould do not have much use for Teilhard's thought. And I think one criticism they would have is that he underestimates the role of accident in 
evolution. So, for example, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs and allowed all of us to evolve and, and be here, if that had been a little larger, uh, def nobody would be here. Yeah. Uh, if it had missed the Earth or been a lot smaller, the dinosaurs would still be here, and who knows if they would care about spirituality at all. So <laughs> uh, I was, I'm just wondering, uh, as, as an advocate of, of Teilhard's ideas, uh, how you would, would kind of address those, those kind of criticisms and, and how would Teilhard her, himself perhaps talk about, did, did, he, did he truly underestimate the role of accident in evolution? Yeah, well, I mean, there's two things. I mean, I think one, Dawkins and Hitchens got is pretty primitive, you know. I mean, it's something what we, you know, they kind of have a, a sort of a straw guard, you know, kind of the male, right, the male dominant figure who, you know, sets things in motion. And, you know, why would a nice God like that allow bad things to happen to us good people? So uh, who needs this God? So, all right, we ditch him. Uh, second thing about accidents in nature, uh, you know, had the asteroid been larger, we would have been here smaller. Barrow and Tipler, you know, refer to the, uh, the anthropic principle, right? So this cosmic evolutionary story is so finely tuned, and it is really finely tuned. I mean, forget the asteroids. We're going back at the beginning of this thing. Had it been like 10 to the minus 33rd second faster, you know, the whole thing would have just flung apart. Uh, and it had been 10 to the 33rd times slower, you know, and, and had, you know, and it would have contracted. So there's something that's so... Oh, and scientists love to say, well, we'll just find the laws, you know, that unify everything and, you know, we'll just figure this out. No. You know, and that, that, that is the thing. It is, there is a place for mystery, you know. There is a place for mystery, what I might call mystery as one of the new ontologies of cosmic life, right? Uh, it's not just, oh, we can't figure this out. No, there's really a level of indeterminacy that runs all the way through into infinity, you know, and therefore we need a new logic. Quite honestly, science has done well, you know, certainly left side brain and building our world, but we need a new logic today that's based on love, the logic of the heart, the logic of love. And that, that doesn't bode well with scientists, does it? You know, we're gonna figure this out, but you know, let's, let's put this in another way. Does knowing your DNA genome get you up in the morning? No. You know, does knowing the intricate details of how chlorophyll work, does that really incite passion and beauty for you when you look at a flower? No. Things like passion, beauty. Uh, beauty is a good one, right? What makes something beautiful is not because it has a DNA, you know, genomic system, or this is its chlorophyll, or, you know, now I understand the paramedic, um, you know, carbon-based atoms and why they're situated this way. Is that beautiful? It could be, if you're a scientist. But the beauty is precisely in the whole. The beauty lies precisely in the way that carbon is situated in its bondedness to other carbons. And if, if scientists, you know, a humble scientist will recognize that it's even when they're studying a particular, it's always the particular within the larger context of the whole. The whole is the right side, you know, of passion, beauty, and ultimate goodness. So Dawkins, he's made a lot of money, truthfully, but, you know. Okay, one more question. Yeah. Uh, why did the Christ come when he came? Yeah, right, yeah. You know, I asked him that, and, the, and the, I truthfully, <laughs> I don't. And I can just say, you know, it, this is pure speculation, right? God works in God's, I mean, you know, not that I want to just throw it on to God, but it is a question of mystery. Why in this time? And I do think it has to do, if I were to just speculate, it has to do with axial consciousness. We reached a stage in cosmic biological evolution where our level of consciousness now was not only open to divinity, but open to divinity and biological cosmic life in a new way that emerged in Jesus. Um, you know, and there's something about he's sort of a tipping point for, in fact, quite honestly, Jesus tips off second axial period consciousness in the first axial period. Uh, and so it is, to me, I think the, the timing of it, so to speak, has to do with our level of readiness in terms of or biological cosmic life in terms of 
God breaks through in this level of consciousness now at this point and now is um, open to love and to community in a new way. One more question. I was just curious, you didn't address self-love. Um, and I think that's a real... Self-love, yes. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah, don't get me. That's an important point. And you know, when you come to the law, the law of the New Testament, right? Love of God, love of neighbor is conditioned on love of self. No love of self, no real love of God and love of neighbor. And truthfully, I don't even think you can really love the God you know, without really loving yourself, because that God is at the heart of self, right? So thank you for maybe making that explicit. Um, I think Jesus, and by self-love, in other words, recognizing the good in our life, you know. In fact, loving the self, that's this self, you know. In a sense, I don't have to be. Culture tells us don't really, you don't love who you are because you can be better. You know, you can look more beautiful, you can run faster, and all this kind of stuff. So our, our, our you know, Merton's true self, false self. That the self that I love is the God, the self that God has loved from all eternity. The self that I'm trying to be, this false self, is God, the self that God knows nothing of, right? You know, for, furthest from God. So actually, this might play in our afternoon talk as well. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Okay, so with that, um, we're going to break for lunch. And uh, for, break those, for, lunch. for those of you who